Driving at home with ABOR's housing economist, Claire Losey. Hey guys, Happy New Year. We're excited to bring you a new Driving at Home here in a video format. I'm here with Dr. Claire Losey. Good morning and Happy New Year. Good morning, Emily, and Happy New Year's to all of our listeners. Yeah, well, um, I'm excited for you to give us a bit of a prediction or a peek into what you think is coming in 2024. I know I'll have to push you a little to actually make the predictions, as is typically the case with economists, but uh, we won't hold you to it, but we're excited to know kind of what you think is coming as we're looking towards a new year and our members are in their business planning and getting ready for what we hope will be an exciting uh, market year. Indeed, indeed. I think the phrase for 2024 is essentially cautious optimism, just the idea that, of course, 2023 was marked by this market shift in which we saw, you know, kind of the ongoing effects of mortgage rates, of course, higher mortgage rates, and then just our market adjusting to those post-pandemic conditions. But moving into 2024, we'll kind of talk about where rates, home prices, and sales will potentially be in the Austin market. And again, I think listeners will come away cautiously optimistic. Uh, I like the optimistic part of cautiously optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll settle there a bit, but uh, fair to say that we're hedging a touch. And I think, you know, there's been quite the shift at the end of last year, and then now we're in 2024 looking at m more positive headwinds for us. But um, I know that we need to hedge that and be careful that we're not kind of overstating as well. Exactly. Yeah, so what are you expecting with rates specifically into this year? So we all know that 2023 brought particularly high mortgage <laughs> rates on a recent historical basis, right? The highest rates that we'd seen since 2001. Right. However, the good news heading into 2024 is that mortgage rates are likely to gradually dissipate. And I'll stress gradually there. We aren't expecting any significant shifts in mortgage rates per se, but maybe hopefully, somewhere to the tune of ending up in the low to mid 6% range. Yeah, that sounds uh, far better than what we were seeing in the early fall of last year. Exactly. Um, certainly in the context of the fact that we're still in a really competitive market, that prices were continued to sort of push and weren't softening so much to accommodate those high interest rates of last fall. So that sounds like a good thing for buyers. Indeed, indeed. And there's been a lot of discussion in the news and probably folks have tuned into this, as to whether there'll be this surge of refinance activity mm. in the wake of lower rates. Right. I would, I'm generally inclined to say probably not. I don't think that mortgage rates are going to decline significantly enough to really spike that refinance activity among those buyers who purchased maybe in late 2022 or sometime in, in 2023. Yeah, the but gap's gotta be big enough that it's worth the origination rigmarole fees. and the cost, right? Exactly, exactly. That but overall, sense. of course, as mortgage rates decline, of course, they're going to start the year a little bit higher and we yeah. should see this softening over time. But as they do decline, home buyers purchasing power will increase. So essentially the maximum home price that they can afford will will rise slightly. Yeah, yeah. so uh, my sense is that everybody sort of took a breath and we were just relieved initially that we're not looking at, or, or that we did not see one more spike at the end of 2023, and then sort of anticipating and hopeful that there will be this soft and kind of low um, pullback on the rate overall next year. That's right, this that's year. right. And two, we also have to remember the elephant in the room, um, no analogy, being made, but just it being an election year. <laughs> well played. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, the potential effect of the election on the 10 year Treasury yield, of course, the 10 year Treasury yield, its direction and magnitude of its shifts are the most significant indicator of the future direction and yeah. magnitude. Of, of change with respect to mortgage rates. What, what does history tell us about how, about volatility in response to elections? And is that specific to the dynamics of that individual election cycle? Or is it just elections are, are funky business and they create funky business in the economy? That's a really great question. And I would say it is somewhat dependent on the specific election itself. Moving into this year, it appears that we're going to have two candidates who have already previously run against each other, and we can predict maybe a little bit more volatility with yeah. respect to the 10-year T yield around the time of the election, but I wanna stress that that's 
more of a shorter term trend, so it's not something to really look at as a long-term prognostication, but Yeah, it makes so. sense to me also that you're, you know, when the gap between them is so far that there's a higher degree of volatility to some degree because the markets are trying to predict which end of the fringe we might be working towards. Right, right. Which is, you know, we will ride that out together <laughs> this year. Exactly, exactly. And see what comes next. What else are you predicting in 2024? So with respect to home prices, and we have to remember that in 2023, you know, we saw double digit declines yeah. on a year over year basis in home prices. I am anticipating that home prices are going to be essentially flat mm. relative to last year with a magnitude of 5%, either yeah. way, three to 5%. Up or down. Up or down. Yeah. Um, on a year over year basis. The reason being, of course, that mortgage rates are still elevated, although they're, again, expected to decline, they do remain elevated, at least on a recent historical basis. And two, we have to remember that home prices are still very much elevated themselves relative to pre-pandemic levels. You know, right. in 2023, in any given month, home prices, the median sales price was still 40 to 50% higher than the commensurate month in 2019. Right. So overall, just, you know, kind of eking away at home buyers' affordability and, and just, again, coupled with a still high mortgage rate environment. Right, I mean, my sense is that a flat home price this year is is still an incredible value in the sense that we continue to have pressure on available housing stock and the continued growth here and the continued interest in buyer demand and that given those years of double digit increases the one year and a half ish of softening was not enough to make up how high we were right and and so if you're if you're staying stable as a seller you've still got incredible value and prob probably incredible equity in the property as well exactly and we have to remember too that the covid-19 pandemic was such an anomaly in and of itself <laughs> in all the ways <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in and of itself yeah. and it really sparked all of these you know, effects in the Austin housing market in particular, yeah. where we saw that exorbitant sales activity, price growth, you know, is really um, the product of a number of different factors, right? Just working from home, so yeah. people were no longer commuting to their jobs, right. and they could choose to live farther out maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, changes in household preferences with respect to the characteristics of their homes, wanting bigger homes, you know, office space, all yeah. of that folks relocating to the Austin environment, especially as businesses relocated. Right. So there, and of course, to the lower rate environment during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the point of reiterating all of this is just to say that we had, we experienced demand that we otherwise wouldn't necessarily have seen mm. during that period. Yeah. And we have to remember that over the long term, on average, housing tenure has increased. Right. So homeowners tend to stay in their homes on average now about nine to 10 years. Mm. So, you know, as we're thinking about buyers matriculating through the market, we have to remember again that more, a higher proportion of buyers actually entered the, the market during the pandemic than otherwise would have. Right. And so we're continuing to kind of see just the effects of that, right? Just a little bit of dissipation. Right, and and you know, and even at that, that excess in demand was at, the, at a height of a nearly 10 year trajectory leading up to that exactly. point. That was just normal market run, you know, growth right. in Austin, significant economic anchors, and then layered with the excess that the pandemic drove. It absolutely makes sense that we've softened some of that, but I think the demand is still very high here based on everything that you tell us Indeed. and the experiences Indeed. of our agents. Um, and you know, I think that we will see strength in that, especially if prices do hold into right. next year. Right, and I think too, 2024 could be a better year for first time buyers than mm. 2023 was, just given where we expect home prices and mortgage rates to kind of continue to settle out. And if nothing else, maybe more predictable, which exactly. also just in terms right. of, the, of agents, of you guys working with your clients, predictability can be such a value and just setting expectations. This is what it's gonna be. This is within reason what we think your interest rate will be when you close or when it, when it comes time for that. Um, that gives some assurance that this is a move that you can understand and rely on to some degree as well. Right, right, and especially as we're not anticipating 
those broad swings in the federal funds rate, right. for example. When you're you know, constantly wondering what your buying the, power is going to be right, as a the buyer. Next rate hike could be. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. two, another factor that could drive mortgage rates lower is just the fact that the Fed may decide to actually cut rates mm. in 2024. Right now, if you look at their summary of economic projections that was published in December, essentially we're looking at potentially a 50 to 75 basis point or 0.5 to 0.75 percentage point decline in the federal funds rate, which is an indirect, has an indirect effect <laughs> on mortgage rates. As we've talked about many times on this podcast. Right, yes. everyone's <laughs> sick of, of me talking about that. But essentially just the idea that it could induce downward pressure on yeah. rates, especially as the inflationary pressures hopefully continue continue to ease. So we're we're in January. We're going to start where we start. What you should be able to relay is that there's some level of uh, reliability that that this is probably the height for the year, and that if anything, things are only going to get better. And I think you hedge that carefully in terms of agent to client conversations, so that they don't hold out and wait to see what happens. But understanding that even if there are those reductions, they're likely to be sort of. Uh, nominal modest, at first, right. modest, and 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 I think that gives a healthy amount of just calmness, you know, to the transaction and understanding in terms of what buyers are facing into this year. Exactly. What else are you predicting in 2024? So with respect to sales, similar to home prices, just in the sense of likely essentially flat relative to 2023, again, magnitude of three to five percent up or down in any individual month on a year-over-year -year basis and similar rationale to that of expectations for home prices just with respect to kind of our market readjusting to post-pandemic conditions mm. you know firmly entrenched in that higher rate environment and as we were talking about you know kind of that Pent up demand and excess demand, right. so to speak, that was being met during the COVID nineteen. We've pandemic. caught up a little bit. Is right. the idea, right? And so now we're, I mean, still in an incredibly healthy market. Realistically, um, it did not feel that way as the jolt sort of happened quickly following the pandemic. But this is strong. I mean, where there's balance to some degree between buyers and sellers, and some availability of housing stock, whereas there was almost none. Um, where this balance should feel like an active marketplace is my sense in 2024. Yes, indeed. And two, we have to remember, so we talk a lot about the rate of change. And for math folks, that's the first derivative. And if that makes your head spin, that's totally okay. That's very academic and impressive. <laughs> just, I have just, not a clue what you're saying. <laughs> just bear with me. So we talk a lot about the rate of change, which is year over year, month over month. Um, yeah. But you also want to be attuned to the rate of change of the rate of change, the second derivative, mm -hmm. which essentially is just... Is that like the committee on committees? Because I've heard <laughs> of that as well in the association world. <laughs> it's just a very complicated way of saying, for example, increasing at a, at a decreasing rate, okay. something to that effect. So, you know, for example, if we do see a month in 2024 where, you know, home prices are higher, say they're 3% higher than the previous year, they're increasing, right, at, you know, maybe an increasing rate. Um, but it, for example, if we see a negative year-over-year -year number, then it's, in, or it's decreasing, right, but right. at a decreasing rate. A so the slower, slowdown. slower change yeah. overall. Right. Less dramatic, more yes, stable. less dramatic shifts. Incrementals up and down. Right. Is what we should anticipate into the year. Right. The, Which should be easier for agents as they're articulating to clients the status of the housing market. You know, right. I think it's been really difficult over the last year to watch them have to kind of explain volatility. And that part of why we even launched this podcast and the work that you're doing with us was to create opportunity to improve our narrative around that. But I think this year, what we'll see to your point is slower ups, slower downs year right. over year. Right. Um, and in the long run, a lot of health still in the market. Exactly. Yeah. Just the idea, as you're saying, that there should be less volatility on yeah. average. Ups and downs will happen still. Right. That's to, to a lesser degree. Right. Right. Um, well, talk to me a little bit about what you predict in terms of and, and the thing that we can most impact uh, locally with city council, with our efforts from a regulatory standpoint to provide for more housing. What are you expecting this year? And I'm stepping on the toes a little bit of Taylor Of, of Taylor Smith. Smith, our Deputy Director of Government Affairs, but he'll who's, like this. He's so <laughs> awesome. But, you know, just thinking about 
changes that the city is trying, emphasizing trying, yep. to make with respect to the land development of code. Of course, the HOME initiative was recently passed on December 7th, and it essentially just allows for more housing supply to be built on any individual parcel of land. Yeah. So up to three units, three housing units could potentially be built on an individual parcel of land. And this really constitutes redevelopment, right? I mean, the majority right. of activity that would be happening in the city of Austin on this front would be in the case of a developer, you know, buying an existing home, and raising that home, in tearing it down. development. Right, right, and then, you know, building a couple more units or whatnot. And I f the first caveat to make is, of course, this is all still matriculating. The home initiative is still matriculating through. Phase one was passed, but there's a second phase that's yeah. a little and, bit variable. And to speak to that really explicitly, because I know that there have been concerns also about how much uh, density we're allowing on single family lots and whether that's an appropriate use of a single family lot or not. Um, don't forget that there's context wrapped around what, what's doable. I could say that three units is what you're able to have on a single lot, but the compatibility standards apply, the uh, need for runoff and you know the, the proper tree cover. I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of land development code ordinances and regulation that sit on top of what you're allowed to do and zoned to do. And so there's a lot of nuance still in where this will happen and where it won't, but the idea is that at least we have supported putting more tools in the toolbox to allow for more housing. Um, with that, we now need to think kind of judiciously and, and appropriately about in the next phase about how, if at all, those compatibility standards change and evolve to allow for more of that housing to then be built where it is zoned at this point. Right. So there's a long way to go. This exactly. is not a fast yes. change where yeah. we said, great, there are three units on every lot in Austin now. And I think there was some conversation from among the community that, that made it sound like that, frankly, and it's not that. It's, there's still a lot of uh, room to create nuance and to be careful about how these additional units make their way to the ground. Yeah, and a couple of thoughts on that too. We have to remember that redevelopment occurs, construction in general, occurs at a very slow pace. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not as if we are going to have, you know, a million developers suddenly flooding the city of Austin right. and tearing down every single lot they can find. You Especially know, it's, when it's still an incredibly painful, slow, and expensive process to right. develop in Austin. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we know, you know, the permitting process is notoriously costly here mm -hmm. and, and timely. So just the idea that we're going to see any significant change, especially in the short term, right. is very doubtful. Right. Over the long term, we know that all else equal, when we allow for, essentially when we reduce regulations, when we allow for more right. housing to be built, that should increase the housing supply, which then should lower prices. I think the variable in this particular context, though, is where exactly the redevelopment will occur. Right. So if it's happening in highly desirable neighborhoods, then of course we're going to be building just more expensive, more expensive homes. homes. Right. Right. So right. we need we need that investment in some of the the lower price neighborhoods as well. Certainly, and I think that the power of some of the research that you've produced for us and that we've been able to share with our members and, and the community at large is um, things like that missing housing report that identifies not just that there are houses missing, but that they're missing at all price classes and segments of the market. We have to relieve those different price classes together so that we're not just pushing on one side of the balloon to elevate the other and vice versa. Right, yes, and you can read that report on our website. It's the truth about Austin's missing housing. We'll figure out how much we're missing this year later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stay my, tuned on my that. My prediction is that we're still missing way more houses <laughs> yes. than we, yeah. than we should we can, be. Then I can possibly count. Right. I can probably only count to 2,000. <laughs> Kidding, kidding. It's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's what Excel is for <laughs> when, yeah, when we go there beyond. We go. There we go. Uh, um, well, Claire, it sounds like it's going to be a good year. I think it's one that my sense w is uh, will be more predictable, I hope, than what we have seen. There's some amount of unpredictability, certainly in an election year, and we'll continue to monitor that and monitor the market's response to it. Um, but I think that agents should be heading into this year feeling more confident in the conversations they're having with their clients about what to expect. 
And I think that, if anything, that creates more trust in their relationships with their consumers as well. Indeed, indeed. And I'll be unpacking all of this a little bit more at our annual meeting on January 31st. We would love for you to be able to attend and to hear your thoughts on the market. You can feel free to email those to communications at abor.com ahead of the meeting, and I'll try to touch on as many as I can during that segment. And as always, feel free to email communications at abor.com for ideas about the podcast, feedback, et cetera. Sure. We always love hearing from our members. We will look forward to seeing you guys at annual meeting, and Claire will look forward to seeing you next week. Sounds great. Thanks, Thanks. guys. Take care and happy 2024.